Good morning. Welcome to worship. We are delighted that you are here, whether you are here in the flesh or joining us online. Thank you for lending us your attention and your presence and your prayers and your your goodness. So I'm delighted that you're here. I just have a few announcements. Number one, because the United Methodist Church has finally uh, become a fully inclusive body, even though Hennepin Church has for 30 years, we want to make a really strong witness at Pride this year. Are you with me? All right then. So we need people who are willing to be in the parking lot. You only have to do a two hour shift. We'll feed you, we'll hydrate you. We just want friendly people helping people park their cars so that they can go to one of the best parties in town. So we are looking for people to sign up for Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, so you don't have to do all those things, but just one, it just takes one. So I will beg you further. Um, and I really encourage you, you can sign up online there's a there's a sign up thing there and we'll put a sheet at the welcome desk so you can sign up there too we will find you and I hope that you find this an opportunity uh, to give back and to celebrate secondly Hennepin Church is uh, is going to host a parking lot party on the 10th of July we will have a bounce house, we will have a band, we will have food trucks, we will have face painting. It'll all be along Groveland so that anybody passing by will see that we are more than just a pretty face, right? It's a beautiful building, our parking lot is great, but we wanna share warmth with our neighbors. So please plan on attending and uh, it doesn't even matter how long you're there. There's nothing worse than going to a party and nobody's there and you think, what has happened here? Why does nobody like this place? Come, play with us. That's what I'm saying. Um, and lastly, God bless the men in our lives who have taught us the ways of love, who have stood by us, whether they are biological fathers or fathers of the heart. Uh, we give thanks on this day for beautiful men. So we are going to continue in worship. Please rise in body or in spirit for the call to worship. Hear the good news. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. In Christ, we are a new creation. We walk by faith and not by sight.
Let us pray. O God of light, source of all illumination, revelation, and truth, be for us an eye-opener. Surprise us with revelation, astonish us with beauty, and shock us with truth. Enlighten us that we might proclaim the wisdom of your truth, the beauty of your creation, and the graciousness of your mercy. Just as you gather the whole creation into the circle of your love, teach us to draw one another into the circle of love. Dissolve the barriers that keep us apart, break the walls that separate us, clear the hedges that hem us in, straighten the paths that lead us to one another, and smooth the roads that bring us back to you. And now let our praise rise to you. Bless those that worship with us and bring us all closer to you. Amen. You may be seated, and my favorite people can come up here and hang out with me, which are children. No offense, adults. I, some of our kids are at camp this week, so we might be a little low. But I see some friends coming. <laughs> Good job, Mom. <laughs> you want to come sit up here on the rugs here closer to me or no? I can come to you. That's okay. Hello. Oh, you're going to sit. Yes, you are the best. Good job. All right. I have a question. Wes, I know you're really smart, so I want you to think about this. And I bet you guys are really smart, even though I don't know you as well. Can you tell me anywhere where you know there are candles? Where have you seen candles before? At my home. Where at your home? Uh, in the dining room. In the dining room? Okay. Your On your table. When do you, when do you light them? You don't know. Okay, think about it. I'll come back to you. Can you think? Do you have a place? Where have you seen candles? Oh, I see me. You see you. Yes, you do. That's amazing. It's just like at the store on those like monitoring cameras. Those are always exciting too. You can check your hair. Um, have you ever seen candles on a birthday cake? Raise your hand if you've ever seen that. Seen candles on a birthday cake? Have you ever seen candles? Wes has seen them on his table. I thought about that. And you're on your cake, too. When you were four, yes. That is really long ago. I know. Me, too. Me, too. Um, have you ever seen candles in the room that you're in right now called the sanctuary? Where are they? Can you point them out? Where are they? Right. How many do you see? There is one, two. They tricked you. This one's not lit today, so there's three. And look at this. This is filled with candles. And candles... They're kind of dangerous, which makes them kind of fun. But they also sometimes act as a symbol for us. And a symbol is something that stands for something else. So sometimes in church, we use candles as a symbol of prayer. It is sand. It is sand. Or a symbol of connecting to God and remembering that God is always with us. So today, the grown-ups are going to talk a little bit about these new, brand new sand tables and bless them because they're a really cool new thing in our church to help be a symbol for us to connect to God. And if you come hang out with me in Sunday school, we're going to make our own version of a candle sand table. Parents, I thought about using glitter, but I opted not to. You're welcome. It was really tempting though when I was in the aisle. I was like, that would be so cool looking, but you would hate me. So we're going to make our own version of sand tables so that you can have a candle is a symbol of God being with you at home, and you can light it at home as well, okay? So if you want to come with me, if there's anybody else who didn't come up front but wants to come hang out with me and some other teachers and some other friends, you can meet us right here at this door. Let's go. For the Unknown Self by John O'Donohue. So much of what delights and troubles you happens on a surface you take for ground. Your mind thinks your life alone. Your eyes consider air your nearest neighbor. Yet, 
It seems that a little below your heart, there houses in you an unknown self who prefers the patterns of the dark and is not persuaded by the eye's affection or caught by the flash of thought. It is a self that enjoys contemplative patience with all your unfolding expression. It is never drawn to break into light, though you engage yourself in unworthiness and misjudge what you do and who you are. It presides within, like an evening freedom that will often see you enchanted by twilight without ever recognizing the falling night. It resembles the under-earth of your visible life. All you say and do and think is fostered deep in its opaque and prevenient clay. It dwells in a strange yet rhythmic ease that is not ruffled by disappointment, no. It presides in a deeper current of time, free from the force of cause and sequence that otherwise shapes your life. Were it to break forth in today, its dark light might quench your mind, for it knows how your primeval heart sisters every cell of your life to all your known mind would avoid. Thus, it knows to dwell in you gently, offering you only discreet glimpses of how you construct your life. At times, it will lead you strangely magnetized by some resonance that ambushes your vigilance. It works most resolutely at night, as the poet who draws your dreams, creating for you many secret doors decorated with pictures of your hunger. It has the dignity of the angelic that knows you to your roots, always awaiting your deeper befriending to take you beyond the threshold of want, where all your diverse strainings can come to wholesome ease. I invite you to join me in an attitude of prayer. Gracious and loving God, on this Father's Day, we gather with hearts full of gratitude for the fathers, grandfathers, and father figures who have shaped our lives with love, wisdom, and guidance. We give thanks for their strength, their sacrifices, and their steadfast presence. We lift up those whom this day is difficult, those who have lost fathers, those who yearn to be fathers, and those who have challenging relationships with their fathers. May your comfort and peace surround them. We lift up to you, Holy One, the families of Maggie Burgett and Don Selger, whose funerals were this past week. We pray for your comforting presence to be with their loved ones. Surround them with your love and support of your community as they navigate this time of grief. May Maggie and Don rest in your eternal peace, and may their memories be a blessing to those who knew and loved them. God, we also celebrate the new and exciting things blooming in the life of our church. We are grateful for the new ministries and initiatives that are taking root and flourishing. 
Bless the hands and hearts involved in these endeavors, and may they bear fruit, fruit that it glorifies your name. Guide us as a congregation to remain open to your Spirit's leading, embracing change and innovation with faith and hope. As we enter the summer season, we pray for the safety and well-being of our students. Grant them a time of rest, joy, and adventure. Keep them safe in their activities and tra travels, and may the summer be a time of growth and renewal. Bless their families and caregivers and those who support them, and help them to create cherished memories during this season. We pray for all those who are traveling during these summer months. Grant them safety on their journeys and bring them back to us refreshed and renewed. May your presence be with them wherever they go and may they find opportunities to witness your love and grace. We pray for strength to be good stewards of the relationships entrusted to us and to foster connections as they reflect your inclusive love to build a community where everyone feels valued and cherished. May we continually strive to honor you in all that we do, seeking to serve others with humility and grace that you have shown us. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray now, who taught us to pray, saying, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, holy and blessed is your true name. We pray for your reign of peace to come. We pray for your good to be done. Let heaven and earth become one. Give us this day the bread we need. Give it to those who have none. Let forgiveness flow like a river between us, from each one to each one. Lead us to holy innocence, beyond the evil of our days. Come swiftly, Mother, Father, come. For yours is the power and the glory and the mercy. Forever your name is all in one.
may be seated. And we have the incredible blessing of dedicating these sand tables. As I mentioned last week, I asked uh, the gentlemen who are artists in this church, would they make some sand tables? Figuring they wouldn't look like this. Um, these are hand carved. They are testament to the beauty of organic materials and human hearts. So again, I want to thank uh, Bruce Ahrens, Rich Bartel, Lee Carlson, Barry Fox, John Haberman, John McKeon, and Craig Peer uh, for the ways that they responded in such powerful ways. And what we'll be doing following uh, the invitation to the offering is you are welcome to come up during the offertory, take a taper, light it on the center pillar candle and affix or really put that candle down into the sand. You can light it for any reason. Perhaps you have a prayer that you want to see lit and present, or perhaps you want to bear witness to the power of men that have blessed you, or perhaps you don't know what to say, but you trust that God can hear you. So during the blessing of the music in the offertory, um, we'll invite you to come forward and light a candle. So these sand cat tables have been lovingly made and are presented for consecration to the glory of the almighty God and for the service of this church. We accept these tables as a sacred trust and will guard and use them reverently. In the name of the one triune God, we consecrate these tables to the glory of God for the next 150 years of ministry here. Would you pray with me, please? Most gracious God, we thank you for the ways that you plant creativity and artistry in the hearts of your servants. We ask that you would accept the gifts of the hands who created this art and all of us as we comprehend what it is that you invite us to day by day, which is conversation with you and with your creation. Grant us your blessing as we have consecrated this gift to your glory, that our lives may be perceived as a consecrated gift in creation. We pray through Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. So, uh, please feel welcome to come forward and light a candle. It's a form of offering. And as we share our tangible gifts on this day, our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, our witness, give thanks that you are a part of a beautiful human community of grace. Let us enter into a time of offering. Yeah. Yeah. 
and gracious God, we pre- with gratitude we present these offerings to you. Transform our gifts and our lives, making us into instruments of your will. May these offerings bring healing, comfort, and strength. And may we dedicate ourselves wholly to your service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I read from the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verses 21 and to the end. Jacob cheated his older brother from his birthright or his place in the estate of their parents. Jacob tricked his father into granting him, Jacob, a blessing to go with that inheritance and go into the future. Jacob, under his mother Rebecca's advice, and father fled for his life away from the venomous anger of his hurt and cheated brother. Went to the north country and there married and made family. And then he found that he needed to go home and face his destiny. But during the night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He got them safely across the brook, along with all of his possessions. But Jacob stayed behind by himself, and a man came and wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he couldn't get the best of Jacob as they wrestled, He deliberately threw Jacob's hip out of joint. The man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. Jacob said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. The man said, what is your name? He answered, Jacob. The man said, but no longer. Your name is no longer Jacob. From now on it is Israel, which means God wrestler. You've wrestled with God and you've come through. Jacob asked, and what is your name? The man said, why do you want to know my name? And then right then and there, he blessed Jacob. Jacob named the place Peniel which means the face of God. Because he said, I saw God face to face and lived to tell the story. The sun came up as he left Peniel, limping because of his hip. This is why Israelites to this day don't eat the hip muscle, because Jacob's hip was thrown out of joint. Amen. I share with you portions of a piece of writing I came across recently. As good writing does, this writing saves me. And I'm hoping it will be blessing to you as well. Writer Lydia Yuknovich speaks her heart and she says, so that I might not be consumed by warring voices of people with power or their surrogates, this morning I listened to birds. So that I might release some of the heaviness of human being, I stood at the lip of the ocean and I let the water lap over my feet and legs. So that I might breathe with the world instead of against it, I walked quietly within Sitka and elder stands. So that I might ease my heart, I ate blackberries and huckleberries and salmon berries in the forest, which I could also trace in the bear scat. I bit down on lemon balm. 
I closed my eyes and I listened to the movement of air in trees and in grasses so that I might write. I forgave myself for being human. I reminded myself that stories are not nothing, that to enter story space is to enter a motion larger than me or any one person. To enter story space is to join the motion of being in the world. We do not have to swallow the stories that we have been told to swallow. We might yet turn to different stories or turn into different stories at any moment or at every epoch. The story of Jacob, which was just read beautifully by my beloved husband, is no small thing. This wrestling with this man, this angel, what has this wrestling story to do with us? A few weeks ago, here in this very pulpit, I did a thing. I sang a little bit during my sermon, and it surprised some of y'all. But I want to say something about singing and me and preaching and life. In college and beyond, I knew myself to be a singer. I was that most blessed of things, a first soprano. Anyone else ever be a first soprano? I'm biased. My heart was given wings through song. I was in musicals in Duluth and at the Big Top Chautauqua. I played Maybelle in the Pirates of Penzance, which is the most diva role ever created. I did coffee houses and I sang as a soloist at the Rittenhouse Inn and with the Arrowhead Chorale in Duluth as well as with the Duluth Symphony. So before I studied theology, I sang it as a soprano. Some 19 years ago, shortly after Cooper and I got married, today is our anniversary, incidentally, yay. <laughs> Some 19 years ago, I needed to have some surgery. And the surgery was supposed to be short. So for the first time having surgery, I did not let the anesthesiologist know that I was a professional user of voice. The surgery got complicated, and it went long. And the over-large breathing apparatus lay on my vocal cords for too long. I woke up from that surgery with no voice, none. I couldn't speak, and I surely could not sing. And that lasted for long enough that I went to a voice therapist for help, for what they determined was a paralyzed vocal cord. There wasn't much they could do for me. But I worked with a voice therapist for months, and she was such a good healer for me because she understood the emotional reality that without my voice, I didn't know who I was anymore. And my grief was huge. Gradually, my voice came back, but it wasn't the same. My, per, my church at the time, Richfield United Methodist Church, was kind and they were understanding about my raspy preaching voice. And I did not sing except in my voice therapist's studio. After many sessions together, she asked me, how's your singing going at church? And I looked at her like, are you crazy? I told her I would never use my singing voice in public. It was awful. It was nothing like the voice that I had taken so long for granted. No, I told her, there's no way I'm going to sing in front of people at church. And she took a deep breath 
and she looked deep into my eyes and she said, you better pray about that. And I thought, you know what I do for a job, right? <laughs> she was talking to me, a pastor, telling me that I needed to pray about something, about trotting out my pain, and about the ugliness of what I thought I heard, and the vulnerability of my less than loveliness. She wanted me to put that out in public before God and before my congregation. I had sung in their midst. They knew the sound of my voice. I was damaged goods. What do you mean, I asked her. She said, you better pray about what it is you want your church to know about life. Is it your intention for them that they would think that the only way that they can sing or speak or live or be is to do it perfectly? Or do you want them to know that their voice and their song and their speaking and their way of being in the world is exactly what the world needs to hear. There is no perfect. Well, I wept in her office because of course she was right. So the following Sunday, I stood in the chancel of my church. I took a breath and without accompaniment, just me and the broken thing that was my voice, I sang. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? And the sound was thin, and it was not lovely and their hearing and their holding of my limping voice was astounding gift to me. Always, I give thanks for that gift. Friends, God finds us. God finds us each and all. We all have things in our lives where we wrestle in the night, do we not? We age. Our children grow up and leave us. We say things we cannot unsay. The tricks that brought us to success just don't seem to be working anymore. And we try to run, but when our defenses are down, at the times when we are least protected, we come face to face with that which will not be silenced, which is this. We wrestle with God every day in ways spectacular and in ways mundane. And like Jacob, and like the wrestle with God, with that angel, we, each one of us, are limping. We get to own that. I could no longer run back then, 19 years ago, and still. I could no longer run from the conviction that had seemingly baked itself into my body, that if I wasn't the best, if I wasn't outstanding at something, I had nothing to share. You know something about that? Anybody here struggle with perfectionism? Yeah? I learned through this struggle with God that I had wasted so much time judging my non-perfection that I forgot to thank God for the gift of the song I had. My voice will never be what it was, ever. And I am still learning to dismantle the wrong story about perfection because it will kill me. Maybe you know something about that, too. Angels wrestle us into awareness, and rarely do we welcome 
these angels. Can I hear an amen? They appear to us when our defenses are down. We may think we are running with our busyness and our self-medicating and our sense that surely we can outfox a reckoning with the angel of truth, but angels find us. They know, and you know the truth of which I speak. You who are like me, flawed and limping and beautiful and whole. I relish this story from scripture. I asked Cooper to read it this morning because it's also one of his favorites. Jacob was running from himself. He was a trickster, and he was a scoundrel, and he took what he wanted, and he stole the household gods of his father-in-law. That's about as down dirty as you can get, right? And he seemed to be unwilling to face what it is his actions meant in the lives of others. And a reckoning came on that riverbank, and Jacob was forever changed. It is a forever story of life. It's been a busy week here, not in Lake Wobegon, but at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. Tuesday, which was only a number of days ago, (laughs) we welcomed Jim Wallace, who spoke in our midst about white Christian nationalism and the racism in this nation that has so long been propped up by people of faith. Jim Wallace spoke of slave owners who didn't want their slaves to hear the radical good news that in Christ there is no slave or free, but all are one. Those verses, Wallace told us, literally got excised, cut out of slave owners' Bibles so that slaves would not apprehend the power of the freedom given us through Christ. And the suppression of rights and access to financial and voting rights continues to be threatened by modern day attempts right now to rewrite God's intention that all people are created in the image of God. All people, no exceptions. It was a powerful night here. And I thank everyone in this church who made it possible. We had a two-week runway, and it happened. Then on Friday night, Cooper and I attended the Juneteenth concert at Orchestra Hall. We were in the midst of a people celebrating the too long awaited freeing of slaves and the stunning conductor of the concert, Jonathan Taylor Rush, and the orchestra featured artists who took us into the struggle for and the grief around the brutal wrestle for freedom and full equality. And they also took us into the celebration that is Juneteenth and what it stands for, which is the long time, hoped for time when racism is eradicated, when all of God's children are free at last. We are in that struggle. We are in that struggle. We are on the banks of the river and the angel is wrestling with the soul of this nation and for our own souls. So will we wrestle with the racism rampant in our nation and in our community and in our hearts? It's a question we all must ask because like Jacob, we are tempted to go blithely along our way, taking from life what we believe is ours by some sort of birthright, when much of what we base our prosperity and our privilege upon was generated through the oppression of others, native people, upon whose land this church stands. Black people whose bodies were used as currency, and whose sweat built this nation, and people of all races who have not been fully included into the prosperity of this nation. We, who are privileged, have some wrestling to do, 
And it's a holy reckoning. There is no other way to work toward healing. We cannot distance ourselves from this struggle because we ought to be deeply tired of running from the healing that we so long to welcome. Jungian writer Carissa Pinkola Estes, who wrote Women Who Run With the Wolves, it is another official Bible of my life, puts it this way, and it echoes the beautifully read John O'Donohue. The doors to the world of the wild self are few and precious. If you have a deep scar, that is a door. If you have an old, old story, that is a door. If you love the sky and the water so much that you almost cannot bear it, that is a door. If you yearn for a deeper life, a full life, a sane life, that is a door. Listen. I don't know what you're running from. I don't even really fully know what I am running from. But what I do know is that God finds us in the midst of the things that are waiting for us to learn. In the middle of the night, in the vulnerable times, in the times and the places where we did not ask for this struggle, God is with us in it. And we will emerge from the struggle a changed and a limping and a more whole people. So in the midst of it all, Find a way to demand a blessing. Did you hear that in the story that Cooper read? Jacob demands a blessing from the messenger of God. May we each use the precious gifts of our imperfections and our voices to join in everything that Juneteenth asks us to remember. We remember that people used to own other people. We remember that people used to take the power and the voices of others and the children of others and their very lives. But as a nation, we wrestled slavery down. So we celebrate Juneteenth knowing full well that there is yet so much internalized and systematic racism work to be done in this beautiful country we love so much. We're not going to engage in this struggle perfectly. And we cannot hide from the work that needs doing. What I want to say is this, God is in this. Pastor Laura is offering a book study on the book that, that, uh, that Jim Wallace wrote. So far there are 17 people signed up. It's not too late. It's on Zoom. You can sign up for that book study because together what we want to do is rewrite the story of this country because it is our story and we want to live into a new day. And so what I want to say to you is this. Happy Juneteenth. Amen.
reason there was a hesitation before the last hymn is I was going to tell you that Samuel Wesley wrote this hymn, and it's exactly the Jacob story, as I'm sure you discerned. God's name is love. So wherever you are in the struggle and the glory that is life, may you know that you are attended by angels and you can demand a blessing. You're not alone. We're all in this together. May God bless and keep you. Amen.